parents, did you know that a 13-year-old boy saved 17 lives during Hurricane Harvey? Or that a five-year-old kid led a group of toddlers to safety after Hurricane Katrina? Do you realize that a third grade girl sewed over a thousand blankets for people who needed them? And have you heard of the teen who invented a flashlight powered by human body heat? Well, these are just a few of the topics that we're going to hear about today uh, with my new guest. And let's be honest, you know, we all harbor dreams of our kids achieving greatness. Some of us even dare to envision them becoming true world changers. Well, get ready for an inspiring conversation because today's guest is the author of a book that will fuel your kids' belief that they can indeed do anything they set their mind to. I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Tim Elmore to the show. Tim is the founder and CEO of Growing Leaders, a nonprofit organization de dedicated to developing emerging leaders. His team equips students across the globe to think and act like authentic leaders, providing them with the tools they need to make a positive impact on the world. Tim's passion for empowering the next generation has led him to speak to over half a million students, coaches, teachers, and parents. But that's not all this amazing as an author. He is the author of over 30 books, including his latest masterpiece, 52 Stories of Kids Who Changed Their World. Tim, welcome to the show. It's so fun to have you back. We, we talked a long time ago, and I don't remember what the topic is, but I have to tell you, this book is one of my favorites. I already like you, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always, no, I it, it's always nice when people like your books, but really, as I told you before we started, um, each of my grown kids has the book because it's, it's a wonderful book to read to your kids that'll yeah, give them inspiration yeah. because it talks about different heroes. Um, and it's, you know, so much of what we hear is negative, but this very, very yeah. inspiring. Now, this book is very different from your other books. Why did you decide to uh, write on this topic? Well, um, a couple of reasons come to my mind, Meg. One is I've been working with young people now for over 40 years. Actually, 1979 is when I first started teaching and working with youth. And um, over the years, I've kind of collated or curated some of these great stories that found themselves in the book. And I thought to myself, you're right, what you just said, Meg. Most of the time, the stories we hear are negative mm -hmm. on the news about kids, mental health issues. They just committed a crime downtown. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, there's just as many amazing stories. But that's not what we hear because right. that's not what gets the news. So um, I loved, loved, loved actually going through these stories myself. And as I wrote them, I was inspired myself. But the other reason is I have found that sometimes families have lost the art of having conversation together. Right. Uh, dinner time is not dinner time. It's get the chicken nuggets in the minivan, race to exactly. soccer practice, yeah. the next thing. And we're not having great conversations about our day or how to debrief the day. So um, at our home, when our kids were growing up, we made sure that five out of seven nights we had dinner together. And I actually told some of these stories back in the day. Right, back in the day, You know, yeah. just start coming. So that's what I wanted to do is create a resource that here's a story. Here's three discussion questions. Here's a link to a video. Have a great conversation. So that's that's kind of my answer to your question. It's a perfect way to get your kids and, um, sorry, it's a perfect way. I don't want to call my 35-year-old a kid. They hate that. But it's a perfect yeah. way to get parents to engage with their kids. Now, Dr. Elmore, you brought a very special guest with you. Her name is Krista, and she's a junior at Boston University. Can you tell us a little bit about Krista? Yeah, well, Krista, I'm going to embarrass you. She's <laughs> one of my young heroes, and she feels funny about that because she thinks I'm an ordinary <laughs> person. But Krista, you and I met when you were in a high school program called Gwinnett Student Leadership Team. She had been handpicked from her high school as one of the student leaders. Uh, so she was a person of influence as a teen. But um, I remember one of her stories, and I'm going to let her tell. But um, Meg, you're going to love it. Mm -hmm. um, middle of the, well, not the middle, in the beginning of the pandemic. Wouldn't that be true, Krista? 
Yeah. You were wrestling with your own struggles. You were at mm -hmm. home. You wanted to be on spring break. Nobody went on spring break. But you found a way to turn, um, I don't know, a problem into a possibility. Uh, Meg, could I ask her just, would it be okay if she just told that story? Absolutely. I'd love to hear it. Okay, go yeah, ahead. So when COVID first hit, I had no clue what to do with myself. I was a busybody. I loved being with people and, and making a difference. And um, sitting around my house was horrible for my mental health. And um, I just felt so drained all the time. And I was like, I want to make a difference. But I am not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not in healthcare. Um, and so I was... I was trying to figure out how I could. Um, and I saw somebody who was doing a similar program in a city nearby. Um, so I started the Gwinnett Meal Bridge, which um, partnered with um, local restaurants and our hospitals. So people would donate money to the local restaurants and then those restaurants would make meals to deliver to the hospitals. So um, it helped keep our restaurants afloat um, that were local and had no other source of income at the time. And it also kept our healthcare heroes fed and energized because a lot of times they didn't have time to go on break. They didn't have time to go home. They were, you know, completely overwhelmed and understaffed. And, you know, I had a lot of friends whose parents were in healthcare. My aunt and uncle are in healthcare. And so, Hearing all these stories, I was like, they need to be supported more than they are right now. And what can I do to help that? Um, and so it was, it, it gave me something to do. It, it fueled me completely. And before this, I had always enjoyed service and always enjoyed leadership, but I didn't understand how much of a, how much of a part of me it was. I didn't realize how fueled it made me feel um, because I had just always been doing it and I didn't get the opportunity to not do it. You know what I mean? So when I was sitting there unable to do anything, that switch to being able to really make a difference was just so phenomenal for me. And it made me feel like alive again and like I had a purpose. Um, and we ended up donating over 3,500 meals and $4,000 worth of snacks and drinks to local hospitals. Um, I also made little care packages for like, um, like retirement homes and retirement communities and like local clinics that were helping um, underprivileged people in their community. So um, it really, it did make a difference. And I heard about how impactful it was from those hospital heroes and they were thanking me and I was thanking them. And it just, it was such a fueling experience. And it also really showed me that this is something that needs to be a part of my life, that leadership and service need to be a part of my life and need to be a part of my future job. And that was a very important lesson to learn right before I went to college. I love it. And I think I hope that what parents out there hear is that teaching your kids to serve and helping them think beyond themselves is so good for them. It feels so good. And um, I love that story. Did you get friends to help you out or how did you, because clearly you couldn't deliver 3,500 meals on your own. Did you, how did you do that? Um, so I worked with the Gwinnett Student Leadership Team, which I was a part of, and I got support from um, people like Miss Ward, who connected me with um, local news channels, and that helped with like the donations and making it more popular. So I was like in three newspapers, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I then I also got connected with other like hospitals and clinics and stuff like that through uh, Gwinnett Student Leadership Team. Um, I did do a lot of the delivery and pick up. I mean, I had nothing else to do. So um, my mom drove and, and I picked everything up, put it in our trunk and then delivered it to the hospital. Um, and um, yeah, but I had a, I had a lot of support from the community. It was hard because you can't really get together with anyone at that time. So it's hard to me. It's hard to like coordinate. Everybody was new to Zoom and new to these like, like this was first, second week of like the shutdown. So um, it was really hard to kind of coordinate with people like that. Um, but what was really awesome was after I got the program set up, um, and had it organized and people understood how it worked, it kind of took off on its own. So, um, local restaurants were, once they were able to, you know, reopen for outdoor seating, they would say, do you want to add $10 to your bill and we can send a meal to the hospital. And so a lot of meals came that way or people would do roundup programs. Like, do you want to round up your change and 
that'll help deliver a meal to the hospital. And so they kind of took it on their own, which kind of just expanded it completely. And I was just really honored to have started a program that was able to function and was able to to kind of be self-sufficient and self-sustaining. So it went on for about um, six to eight months after wow. it started. Um, and yeah, it was it was just phenomenal to have all of that support from my community and my my friends and my parents and everybody involved. How old were you? Um, let's see. I was probably. Sorry, I'm trying to. Do well, you couldn't drive because your mom had to drive you, right? Yeah. So I think I was I think I was 15 or 16. Mm-hmm. Like I either could have just started driving. No. Yes. Sorry, I'm trying to do the math. I think I was about 16 yeah. when it happened. You know, Tim, I, I, I'm i intrigued by the story. Thank you for doing what you did, Krista. That's phenomenal. Thank and you. I know it meant a lot to the medical community. And, you know, Tim, so often as parents, we are hesitant to give our kids responsibility and challenges, thinking, well, they're not really ready for it. Um, talk about why that might be. Yeah. Um, This is just me, but here's what I have observed when I interact with parents in all 50 states. Uh, There's a new kind of parent today, not just a new kind of kid. And I think we're so afraid for our children. You know, we don't want them to skin their knee or get hurt or whatever. And that's all well-intentioned. But Meg, here's what I think. We risk too little, we rescue too quickly, and we rave too easily. Mm. Those are all well-intentioned moves but they have been counterproductive to get a generation ready to take their place like Krista is doing as a young adult. So we risk too little. That's all about, I'm scared for their safety. (laughs) Well, is it part of growing up? I do skin my knee. I do get in trouble. I do have to navigate or negotiate with a teacher when I forgot a project. That's all part of growing up, but we're doing it for them. We really have as parents and even as a culture become risk averse. Yeah, you know, we have adverse. We, we don't want um, our kids to take risks. We don't want them to fail. We don't want them to fall. We want life to be just really, really great for them. But you're right. Until kids take a risk and fall down and mess up, they're not yeah. going to learn leadership skills because a lot of time leadership comes out of what Krista was talking about. You're really struggling with something. And yeah. you need to yeah. oomph your way out of it. And that's an incredible uh, skill for kids to learn, don't you think? Absolutely. In fact, a number of years ago, I did a book called Artificial Maturity. It sounds derogatory, but it's really not. Um, here's what artificial maturity is. Kids in our day are overexposed to information earlier than they're ready and underexposed to firsthand experiences later than they're ready. Um, In that book, I I did some research and I discovered 100 years ago, now that's a long time, but 100 years ago, four-year-olds were doing age-appropriate chores around the house. Mm -hmm. Seven-year-olds were doing some of the work on the farm. Mm -hmm. Nine-year-olds were leading some of those tasks on the farm. 14-year-olds were driving cars. 17-year-olds were joining the army and fighting in World War I. 19-year-olds were getting married and having children. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying we need to go back and do that. I'm just saying it's in them to be so much more than people that get lost on TikTok or Instagram. We have dumbed it down. Kids are ready for high stakes more than we think they are. And if they get into trouble, it's because we've not challenged them to solve problems and serve people. Um, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm obsessed with this. Solving problems and serving people is a sign of maturity. And I think, Chris, I'm going to embarrass you. You have shown that's what I love to do. Solve problems, serve people. That's what that whole thing was about for those months that you were there in 2020 and you found out you won in the process Mm -hmm. i got mental health problems i've got you know (laughs) so um i just believe we can make the difference as caring adults parents teachers coaches if we'll say i'm going to give them a high state project or challenge and i'm going to be right beside them but i'm going to be their guide not their god and they may fall down i'm going to help them get back up but i'm going to show them and they're going to show themselves they can really do something Mm -hmm. Krista, how did you feel about yourself or what shifted or what perspective about life and yourself, if it did shift, before you did this work and after you did this work? 
I, you know, I did talk about how I was struggling with my mental health and I felt a lot better. I, I learned a lot about what leadership and service really meant to me, but I also felt so accomplished and so, yeah, like, like I can do anything. Mm -hmm. Like it was so ambitious. It was so scary. You know, it was overwhelming. I had no clue how to start, but but, you know, those those leaders in my life, my parents, um, adults, you know, at my school through GSLT, they all guided me and they helped me and it happened. And it just felt phenomenal. Um, and it was really, I think, foundational to my willingness to innovate and my willingness to create and 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 make an impact and put myself out there. Um, you know, I did fail during it i how did you fail how in the world could you fail at something like that what happened you know starting out i didn't get as much many donations as i wanted or it was too confusing and people didn't understand how that how Mm -hmm. they could send money to a restaurant and then the restaurant sends it to the hospitals confusing and i you know could have been more clear on it or i could have done more to train people on that because we were all new in technology at that point. And so a lot of people were struggling with that as it was. Um, I had no clue how to like keep track of the money that I was being donated, uh, (laughs) which was scary because that was a lot of money to have uh, to be responsible for. So Miss Ward, like I remember (laughs) she sat on the phone with me for three hours one day and was like, this is what you can do. Like, do you have any questions? And finally I was like, I got to go to dinner, Miss Warren. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah. um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like huge failures. And I have had, I have had those things that, that haven't worked out the way I wanted them and I've pivoted. But this was just an example of like, like making a mistake, pivoting, making a mistake, pivoting. And, and I think that that's how I learned and that's how I experienced it. And um, it taught me to pivot faster and it taught me to be adaptable. And I, I feel like I have always kind of had those skill sets, but I never really like put them into play. And I never really had had something that I said, this is what I did. And like, it was awesome. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Tim, you write a lot of stories in your book. Are there any that stand out to you? And if so, is failure part of um, the experience of some of the people that you wrote about? I would say most of them. So I'm thinking of two right away. Uh, one is, by the way, there are stories of kids who are living today. And then there's some stories of kids from history. So a little boy named Louis who lived during the 19th century in France, he was out in his dad's workshop one day as a three-year-old preschooler. Mm-hmm. And he got a hold of one of his dad's tools. It was an awl. Remember those awls yes, that were pointing? Sure. And he accidentally poked one of his eyes out. Tragic. Well, because medicine wasn't what it is today, the infection grew into the other eye. He went completely blind within less than a year. Well, I love the fact that his parents said, we have got to get a way to get him to a school for the blind. Well, there weren't very many. But they went to Paris and found a school for the blind. I guess it was like a K-12 school. But within a matter of a few years, Louis discovered they really don't have a great way of teaching reading to blind kids. They don't have the current way we have today. So Louis, at 12, began to work on a new method. And by 15, he'd come up with a brilliant method. His name, in fact, is Louis Braille. Braille. Anybody ever heard of the Braille Mm -hmm. system of reading for the blind? He did that as a teenager. Wow. And of course, I never knew that as yeah, a teenager. Yeah. yeah. So here's the great part of the story. That's not even the great part. Uh, so soon the school began using this. And then, you know, of course, the world uses this now. But you know what? Um, you know what tool Louis used to create this new system? <laughs> it was an all oh. the very tool that had created the tragedy, gave him the triumph. The stumbling block became the stepping stone. And I think, isn't that just the way it is? Mm -hmm. If we'll look at it correctly and not get completely negative about it, the very thing, Krista, that pandemic could have thrown you into a complete downward spiral. You Mm -hmm. thought, nope, I'm going to use this. (laughs) 
And and I know I'm bragging on you like a dad, but <laughs> I feel like this is the key. The next gen is going to be way more creative than the older adults. They understand culture and have in intuition where culture is going. So yeah, they're going to need to learn some timeless skills that we can teach them, but they've got some timely intuition that we need. So that was one of the stories. Um, another another story that I love. Well, gosh, I'm I'm even sorting through what what story do I not tell? Mm -hmm. um, I love the story of um, Jimmy. Jimmy lived during the 20th century, not the 19th century, but Jimmy was not like the other boys in his neighborhood or even his brothers. He didn't like going outside and playing ball like all the other boys did. And his mom and dad were kind of forcing him out at the beginning, but then they noticed he just doesn't want to do that. In fact, he was kind of quirky. He liked to play in his bedroom with his socks. Yes, you heard me correctly. Yeah. And so they looked at it and thought, oh my gosh, this bless his heart, you know? But then they thought, well, he's creating little personalities with these socks. Let's get him more socks. <laughs> Jimmy grew up to be the man we know as Jim Henson. Wow. He created the money. Yeah. He created an entire industry out of that sock thing that he did. So I'm loving that parents didn't force him to be something he wasn't. And in fact said, his strength right now is this creativity thing. Mm -hmm. Let's get him more tools to be creative. That's, so there's a takeaway in this book for both moms and dads and kiddos to say, maybe I could do something like that with my strengths. I love it. You know, I'm thinking about Louis Braille and if I were his mother, um, yeah. I would have sensed, oh my gosh, this poor kid is blind. What can I do? And as a mother, my, in, my instinct is to protect and yes. not let him get bullied and make life yep. easy for him. And yet he kind of did the opposite. I mean, he really, it's, yeah. what is it in parents? What are the character qualities in parents yeah. that allow or help our kids to excel in this way? It sounds like one of them is to allow your kids to take risks and, yeah. and to yeah. fail. What are some others? Well, there's one big thought that's on my mind a lot these days. In fact, I'm writing an ebook about it. I believe moms and dads, and for that matter, teachers and coaches, uh, need to move from empathy to compassion. Now, we should always start with empathy, meaning I feel what you feel and I hurt with you. But um, moving from empathy to compassion is moving from I feel what you feel, and that that feels better than apathy, you know. But moving to compassion is I feel it but I'm not, uh, I'm not stopped from acting on this and helping you with it. So here's a good analogy, Meg, that you'll get it as a, as a doctor. It's the difference between you being a patient in the hospital and having a friend by your bed and a nurse by your bed. Mm -hmm. The friend says, oh, I'm so sorry. Can I get you some water? I feel, for, you know, that, and that's good. Better than no, nobody. A nurse goes, I feel what you feel and I'm gonna give you something and I'm gonna get you better. And I, so you're equipping them with compassion. I feel so much that I'm not, I'm looking for a verb and I can't get it, but I'm not uh, paralyzed mm -hmm. from acting on your behalf. Even if it looks I, like I don't have empathy, mm -hmm. I have compassion. So empathy is give a man a fish. Compassion is teach that man to fish. And moms and dads, we've got to go. I just think our kids are too valuable to just feel with them. That's great. Good start. But they need us to go. I'm going to think long term now, not short term. And long-term is, Krista, you could probably do something amazing during the pandemic. So I'm going to, like your mom did, I'm going to drive you around until you deliver those meals. And we're not stopping until we're out of food. Yeah, um, Those are the great parents. So I just want to challenge you. The further out you can see into the future, mom and dad, the better the decision you make today for them. Mm -hmm. uh, that means I'm thinking long-term and I'm not doing the thing that's easy today or soft today. It's I believe too much and you to leave you where you are. And that's hard because it it it, it yeah. feels sort of counterintuitive. Krista, yeah. how did your experience in high school and what you did help you in college? In in more ways than one, for sure. Um I you know, it taught me resilience. It taught me that I did have a great support system that was there for me and could help guide me when I needed them to. Um, it it helped me 
see solutions in the problems that I was surrounded by. And I think that sparked my interest in innovation. And now I'm doing like sustainability innovation. And that has, uh, those projects are really cool and I'm putting them in case competitions. So I'm really hopeful that that those make a difference. So it's, it's something completely unrelated with the pandemic and meals and, you know, giving sandwiches to yeah. healthcare heroes, but it, it fueled this 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 drive in me to to solve problems and make changes. Um, yeah, I think and and I think the reason I was drawn to BU where I go was because they they are passionate about that as well. So they have like a lot of opportunities that involve innovation, um, and I think that that's really cool. But but like Dr. Elmer was talking about finding those opportunities in things that are unique to me and that I'm passionate about, um, I think was something that the the Mail Bridge taught me because it was such an awesome project, but I can't do anything with it now. You know, the, the pandemic is over. Um, so like seeing that and reflecting, like I'm still so grateful for the opportunity and I wouldn't have not done it if given the chance. But now I know that I should look for things that I want to continue to do for the long term and that I'm passionate about and using my strengths and using my passion for sustainability and using my passion for others to to kind of develop these solutions is like, I don't know. I think that that's really important. And I think that that's something my parents valued and they they accepted that, you know, me and my brother were very different, like, um, but they kind of let us both le be leaders in like our own way. You know, that l leads me to think, Tim, about a lot of conversations I've had with parents about their teenagers and particularly teen boys, I think. And they say, I can't get them motivated. They never want to do anything. Um, what can parents do to help their kids, particularly boys who might be a bit immature in their teen years, to get up and go and to try things? Is it important for parents to do it with them? Should they send them off on their own? How, how do they jumpstart that? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that probably doesn't have a simple answer. Mm -hmm. But let me just take a couple of minutes and say, I think, like I alluded to earlier, artificial maturity, overexposed to information, underexposed to firsthand experiences. The reason I call that artificial maturity is a kid might look mature because mm -hmm. they know so much at eight years old. They know, you know their math tables, they can download the latest software, but that same kid at 16 might not be able to look an adult in the eye and have a conversation and shake their hand. So I feel like what we need to do is reinsert experiences. And I think, Meg, to your question, we should go with them at first. Mm -hmm. So when our kids were growing up, we went down to Safe House Outreach in downtown Atlanta, and we served the homeless together. Mom, Dad, Bethany, Jonathan. And then we talked about on the van ride home. Wow, that was smelly. You know, or <laughs> did you see what that guy did? Yeah. You know, or whatever. But we said, boy, aren't you thankful for our home? Yes, I am. You know. But then we talked about what skill sets we were learning. So I would say do it together at first. But eventually, the greatest thing I think my, Pam and I did was we sent them off and said, give it a shot. You don't even need me next to you. And um, so I believe there's going to come a time, moms and dads listening, that we cut the apron strings. We send them off to Boston University, maybe, or wherever. But we so, well, you know why we do that? We believe in them. So my daughter went off 1,500 miles away. My son went off 3,000 miles away to LA mm -hmm. for the college. And at first I was thinking, oh, darn, do they not like us? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. I think they love us. And I think I love them. They were feeling so ready to do this on their own. So I, I just, I'm trying to find my words. I, moms and dads are listening. I know you adore them. And you think what adore them means is keep them close, keep the eight apron strings tied tightly around them and let them know. I think real love is... I'm going to get you ready. So here's one example. My wife, when our kids were in middle school, she had them doing their own laundry. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a punishment. She said, kids, in four years, you're going to be out of here. I want you to be so ready for the laundry room on the, in the residence hall that you won't be crying like that other freshman right. is. You know? yeah. You're going to be teaching. So now I'm going off on a trail here. Mm -hmm. But I, I really believe it's inserting experiences that are intentional. And Meg, maybe reading stories like in this 52, you know, the I Can't Wait book. And once a week, maybe it's bedtime. Maybe you got a seven-year-old. 
tuck them into bed. And Monday night is I can't wait night. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the stories. Maybe it's dinner on Tuesday. You're talking about a story. 52 stories. That's one a week for a whole year. Um, that's my goal is to insert these where we moms and dads are way more intentional about this maturation Well, and I'll process. tell you the truth. <clears throat> As a grandmother, I think I get more out of the stories than the, the parents yeah. or the grandkids because yeah. they inspire me so much. And um, I've always believed in kids working. Even at 14, all of our kids had summer jobs. You know, my son had to stock groceries in a grocery store. Yeah. But I'll tell you now, as an adult, um, and he's married, he wears it as a badge of honor. When yeah. I was 14, I had yeah, to this I've and I had to that. But yet he'd say it really, really helped him with the work ethic. The other thing is my husband every year uh, took a medical mission trip to South America and all the kids went with him and, yeah. you know, kind of rotated who would go. And I will say they're all very other oriented. They're yes. all yeah. in their work and they have very, very different work uh, focused on, you know, helping the poor. And yeah, I think it's yeah. wonderful. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. So, but it was intriguing because I was listening to Krista talk. It's 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 cool that your mom was driving you around. I mean, first of all, you couldn't have gone out there without your mom. But I think it's so important for parents to just sort of lock arms with your kids and say, mm -hmm. "Let's go." Yeah, because for yeah. for that kid that may not want to, but you're absolutely right. As your kids get older, pushing them out is so hard yeah it I, it's scary I, I i remember periods in when our kids went to other countries and worked i just felt terrified and yeah, yeah but but they came back as different people yeah i agree in fact let me illustrate one way how that worked in our family so I do believe we need to insert these experiences that are not guaranteed not insured it's a little bit of a risk. I think that's what fosters maturity. So one night at dinner time, uh, my wife and I and our two kids were talking and both of our kids were in elementary school, late elementary school. And we told one of the stories and we got on the topic of emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. just good interpersonal skills with others. Well, Meg, it was so funny. Both of our kids go, yeah, I'm awesome at that. I'm awesome. You know, and I go inside. I'm going, no, you're not, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. so instead of just a discussion, it turned into an experience. My <laughs> wife and I decided yeah. we were going to throw a party for our adult friends and our kids were going to help us host it. So we locked arms together. There were four of us host to an elementary school, two adults. But I mean, there were like 20 adults that came over. You know what a kid's learned to do? Open the door. Hi, Mrs. Smith. Have you met Mr. Johnson? Could I take your coat? Would you like some iced tea? Well, these kids that thought they'd already mastered interpersonal skills, were, they were worn out at the end of the night. You can imagine. You know how it's oh, yeah. hosting yeah. a party. So we debriefed at 10 p.m. that night, way past their bedtime. And I mean, it was a real discussion then because they, well, first of all, my daughter was hilarious. She goes, Mr. Johnson's EQ is so low, you know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, love you it. I love it. Yeah, I do. But uh, we talked about it's a lot harder than you thought, isn't it? And making conversation where you have a question ready. That's harder than you thought, isn't it? So I'm just saying, parents, listen, create these experiences. They're already happening maybe, but you just separated the adults from the kids. Do it together yeah. and see what might be learned uh, when you include them as potential leaders. I love it. I think that, um, you know, other adults in your child's life, your friends as, uh, you know, parents' friends yeah. are critical in having an impact on younger kids. And a lot of that is teaching kids how to communicate in a comfortable way and a yeah. respectful way with other adults. And I think that sometimes we so underestimate kids, particularly in high school, because we have this mantra, oh, what yeah. teenagers need is more peers. No, what teenagers need is more interaction with your peers, mom and dad, because that's how they really sort of learn what it looks like to act and talk like an adult. We only have a couple more minutes, and I'm intrigued, um, Tim, that you say the, the, the kids in the Gen Z and Gen Alpha um, are going to lead the way into the future. 
how are they different from other generations, do you think? Well, they didn't just grow up with a cell phone. They grew up with a smartphone. And that's been a bit of a game changer. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So uh, what I'm hearing in corporate America is the age of authority is dropping. Mm. In other words, it used to be the older folks, the elders, they have all the wisdom. Just listen to them. Well, now kids are coming in, graduating from college into a job. And while they do need to learn a ton from the 45-year-old boss, they've got something to add. Mm -hmm. They may help the company monetize TikTok for the marketing department. So um, I think we need to be listening as well as telling. And um, Meg, to your point before, I know we're short on time. We, the smartest decision we made as parents, Pam and I, when our kids were growing up, at 13 years old, we introduced a rite of passage experience to our kids. With Bethany, she and I together in the eighth grade, when she was in the eighth grade, we picked six women that would be one day mentors for her that year. Women that she thought were really cool and that her mother and I really respected as wonderful role models as females. Mm -hmm. Some were working on jobs, some were stay-at-home moms, but um, they met and she talked to adults once, uh, you know, six times a year, learning to make conversation. The first gal was Sarah. She's a nurse in the maternity ward. She took Bethany with her into the maternity ward. Bethany was helping women give birth to babies between nine and three that day. Wow. Scares me to death right yeah. now thinking about yeah. it. Then Sarah took her into a class at the hospital that she taught for unwed mothers. Mm -hmm. And she was with teenagers that were pregnant and probably didn't want to be. Well, over dinner that night, every one of these ladies, I asked them to share a life message with our daughter, one that they wish they would have heard when they were in the eighth grade and nobody ever shared it. Sarah's life message for our daughter was handling your sexuality wisely. I won't go any further, but it was, it was adult conversations, adult experiences. And at the end of the year, we had all the ladies over to our house. Many of them had not met each other. They met each other. Bethany served them dinner. So Krista, it was serving other people. Mm -hmm. And then we sat down in the family room and it was very emotional. Bethany sat a chair up in the middle of the room. And even though I coached her to do this, she did it. She read a personal letter to each one of these ladies. Dear Miss Sarah, this is what you taught me. This is how my life changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dear Miss Holly, dear Miss Betsy. Oh my gosh. Well, there wasn't a dry eye no. in the room. And they're talking back and they're giving her herself, their cell phone number and so forth. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the night, I stood up and I tried to explain what a rite of passage experience, how many cultures have a, you know, go from girlhood to womanhood or boyhood to boy. I couldn't make it through my little talk, yeah. but I didn't have to. Every one of these ladies understood intuitively what was happening. Exactly. They got a sofa and chairs, knelt down on the carpet and looking up at our little girl, just spoke words of blessing. Mm. Bethany, you're going to be a great leader. I can just see it. Bethany, you're going to be a great wife if you choose to be. You're going to be a great mom if you choose to be. Oh my gosh. That year, she pivoted from thermometer to thermostat with her friends wow. because the voices of other adults. And by the way, we didn't delegate our parental responsibilities. We just said we want other voices. And uh, it was a game changer. So I guess I say that just to echo what you shared, uh, Dr. Meg. We ought to welcome the other voices of adults in their life, and they should welcome them too. It's, I mean, think about Miss Ward, Krista. She was like a second mom for pa part of your life, wasn't she? <laughs> Yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's also important to give children those voices as an adult. Um, like in high school, I was in such a weird place where I still had to ask to go to the bathroom. But um, in one year, I was going to be living on my own and doing everything on my own. So um, my parents were really good about it. They gave me freedom and I learned from that freedom. I learned from my mistakes when I hung out with my friends too late. I was tired the next day. And, and you know, that was, that was my consequence, you know? Yeah. So my parents... My parents did a great job with it, but it was hard sometimes because my teacher still viewed me as a kid yeah. when I was expected to also be an adult. And so I, I, I love that story. And I love hearing them giving, giving your daughter these stories as an adult and telling her, you know, telling her the truth and telling her how, how it is and not trying to sugarcoat it for kids. Because I, I wish that more adults in my life viewed me as an adult and not mm -hmm. a kid before I 
Yeah. Like, it's like, what's the one year difference from when I'm 17 to when I'm yeah. 18? Now, all of a sudden, I, I can do everything on my own. So my parents did a really great job with that. But I think a lot of parents don't give that freedom and, yeah. and that hurts kids in the long run. So that was just something I thought of and I, I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. Good work. Awesome. My guest is Dr. Tim Elmore, and he is here with Krista, who has told us an extraordinary story. And just by listening to their conversations and Krista's story, it gives you a little taste for what's in the book. I can't wait. 52 stories of kids who changed their world. Tim, thank you so much for writing this book. And thank you for the work that you're doing in encouraging kids to become leaders and encouraging parents to help get their kids here. I just encourage every parent out there, read the book book and read it with your kids. So Tim, thanks so much for joining me and Krista, thank you as well.